For us, it is an honor to have you around here. Our wish is that the secrets of the sages of ancient India, taught by the renowned Yogi Sadguru, be a powerful tool of self-transformation in your inner journey. Get to know our yoga course by clicking on the link that is in the description of this video and learn more. He sings God's praises and every day visits the temple. They took a, a small piece of wood, boom, hit on each person's head. He screamed in pain. The linga that everybody worships, his feet were on it and he was lying down. The yogi said, that's all, go home. There was a great sage, a well-known even today, hugely celebrated sage whose name was Namdev, who came from the present state of Maharashtra. He was a devotee of Vithoba or Vithala. Vithala is one form of worship which uh, this temple in Pandrapur kind of galvanized a whole devotional movements. And Namdev stands out in that. So every day he is a devotee, he sings God's praises and every day visits the temple, spends long time there. He is already known in the town as a very great devotee. So one day somebody looks at him and they say, see, all your devotion is fine, but still you have not realized anything, you're not enlightened. So Namdev got picked. How do you say, I'm not enlightened, I'm just living for God. Every word I utter is of God. How can you say I am not? He said, see, outside uh, the town today, under this particular tree, a few yogis have gathered. Many of them are enlightened beings. Maybe you should go and sit among them, you will realize what you lack. You becoming a celebrated devotee, all right? Slowly people are celebrating you more than the God. <laughs> so you must go sit there. So Namdev said, what's my problem, let me go on. He went and sat there. About ten, twelve, are there and uh, then this person who had suggested this, I think it's time we test out in this group who is a, you know, kachagada, who is an unburnt pot? How do you find out who is an unburnt pot among these twelve, thirteen people who are sitting there? So they took a, a small piece of wood, a plank, a thin plank and went and boom! hit on each person's head by the sound. They will know who is an unburnt pot. When they came and hit Namdev, he screamed in pain. Then they said, ah, this is an unburnt pot. Then Namdev felt deeply insulted, humiliated among people. And then he asked, what should I do? They said, all your devotion is fine, you're doing well on that area, but there's no realization here, you need a guru. He asked, who is that guru? They said, uh, see, if you go like this in this jungle, there's one little temple, there there is a yogi, he's the best guru for you. He went there with a lot of uh, reservations, he went there. When he went and saw, the guru was lying down with his feet, on the deity or the linga that was there, the, the linga that everybody worships, his feet were on it and he was lying down and enjoying the afternoon. Namdev saw this and he was aghast. He's a devotee. He cannot, he doesn't even, you know, in India most people won't even stretch their legs towards this. They will never stretch their legs towards me because that is considered highest level of disrespect. In a temple, they will never ever sit like that. But here this yogi is putting his feet on the linga and lying down. Then uh, Namdev 
became very angry and he said, what is this nonsense? You got your feet on the sacred linger and they tell me I must learn from you? The yogi said, oh, is it my feet are on the linga? I didn't realize. Do one thing, I'm so very tired, can you just, you know, take my legs and put it this way? So Namdev lifted his legs and put it this way. Where he put his feet, there another linga came up. Oh, I'm sorry, once again on the linga, put it here. He again moved it here, another linga came up. Wherever he put it, one linga came up. Then Namdev looked at him completely bewildered. The yogi said, that's all, go home. And then Namdev went home and they never, never went to the temple. People said, what happened to your devotion? You did not went to the temple? He said, I was a fool, I thought he was only in the temple. Now I see him everywhere. So I don't have to go to any particular place. I will go to the temple when I need to, I have no problem with that, but for me, wherever I look, he is there right now. This is what consecration means. Living in a consecrated space means that wherever you look, whatever you touch, should feel like divine. Hmm? To create such a space at home, here, as a thing. Because when we create here, some of you will just smell it and go. It's good, it's a very good smell. You will just smell it. Smell it means I want you to understand. Suppose food comes, mmm, with the smell, then the mouth starts watering, then you have to ingest. If we just small show you the nice smell of the food and take it away, uh, there's no nourishment, there's pleasure but no nourishment. Then some will eat once in a way, so once in a way partake in what we refer to as sacred or divine, essentially intensified life, core life or you soak in it, these are the choices. Whatever your choices, they are your choices. If you think you have a very long life, you can come once in a way, partake in it and go, it's fine because we know one way or the other you will spread it. If you want to soak in it, if you understand, you are a mortal life, life is not forever, you want to soak in it, then such possibilities are there. We will be creating various opportunities where people can live and work. Work and live here, create their own office spaces and live here, various ways. Many, many possibilities we will unfold in the next uh, twelve months or eighteen months. Slowly the unfolding of this will happen. The idea is maximum number of people should soak in the divine, not just have a little, uh, whatever your state of mind has been from your childhood to now, need not be the state of your mind for the rest of your life. Find something that you're passionate about, you need to develop some intensity of attention will naturally come. The easiest thing to do is change the framework of our mind. See, when it comes to physical body and the mind, no two human beings have come with the same capabilities, isn't it? Hmm? Physically, mentally, what one human being can do, another human being cannot do, it's in so many different ways. So instead of getting a title that I'm attention deficiency, I'm ADD, ABC, XYZ, <laughs> so many things. <laughs> The thing is, how to maximize who you are, isn't it? 
you have attention deficiency, but I had another kind of problem, I had too much attention. <laughs> if I pay attention to this one, I can't shift my attention to this, I'm just looking at this only for hours. That also people thought is a problem. People thought it is a problem, he's just looking at one thing all the time. I remember this situation so well, it was so insane. You know, my father is uh, academically excelled all his life, but unfortunately, he produces a son like me, <laughs> who has no concern about academics of any kind. So he thinks he's a very strict disciplinarian and evenings, Seven to nine, every day in the evening, we must all, the four siblings, all of us must study Tch, textbook. I pick up some textbook because it doesn't matter for me what. <laughs> and I open somewhere. I don't care which page, I just open some page. And I, s I find some small speck on the page, a tiny speck, some flaw in the paper. I just look at that, that's about it. <laughs> it just grabs my attention in such a way, I just sit there two hours just looking at this <laughs> speck. I don't read a single word, but I never looked up and looked here and there because it really held my attention. Two hours I'm just looking at the speck because there is so much in a bloody speck, you know? There's an entire world in a speck. People have spent their lifetimes looking after a microscopic molecule or an atom, isn't it? Speck is much bigger than an atom. So, people thought I was going crazy because I had too much attention. So, don't go on labeling yourself this and that. Who… who decides you have attention deficiency? Huh? Is there some standard how much attention you must have <laughs> or how much attention you must get? There is no such standard anywhere, isn't it? You're making it up. The problem is, uh, right from childhood, children are labeled and they are supposed to carry this label for the rest of their life. What level of attention you have at five? What level you may have at six, at seven, at eight, at fifteen or twenty? Can be entirely different. Haven't many of you evolved through this process? Huh? Haven't you? First day school you couldn't figure a damn thing, maybe later on you did well, or maybe first day you looked like you understood everything, by the end of the year you did nothing. <laughs> yes or no? <clears throat> you… you're a young man, there are girls in the neighborhood. <laughs> hmm? So no, that's okay. <laughs> I'm… I'm a mechanical engineer. Are there girls in the neighborhood, I asked <laughs> No, engineers generally tend to have uh, neighborhoods which do not have a lot of girls, so <laughs> They must be moving away for some reason <laughs> <laughs> Where does this come from, mechanical engineer? <laughs> mechanical in the head <laughs> So, you're at a certain age, now you get drawn to somebody, you don't have to concentrate, isn't it? Hello? 
you don't have to concentrate. They will invade. <laughs> so it is only a level of interest. If you have a deep level of interest in something, attention will come. Why will it not come? You still have not found any interest in anything. I don't know which part of the mechanics you're handling in London <laughs> I heard the clock is not working. <laughs> so, if you become profoundly drawn to something, why will you not have attention? Attention will come. Do I have as much attention as somebody else? Maybe not. I never had any attention for what was happening in the classroom, because I didn't find that interesting. I was… but my attention was in all kinds of things. Does it mean to say I don't have a… I have attention deficiency? No, I'm not interested in what they're putting up on the blackboard. That's all. <laughs> so right now, unfortunately, all the girls have moved out of the neighborhood. <laughs> so you have attention deficiency <laughs> Find something that you're passionate about, attention will come. Why will it not come? Not necessarily what I said, just anything. <laughs> I'm taking that example of a girl because there is a chemical support. <laughs> yes, there is a chemistry working for your attention. Other things need little more effort to pay attention to. <laughs> you need to develop some intensity of passion. That's something that is important what you think is important. <laughs> if this comes into your perspective, attention will naturally come. I know others will say other things, but what I am telling you is, whatever your state of mind has been from your childhood to now, need not be the state of your mind for the rest of your life. The easiest thing to do is change the framework of our mind, isn't it? Hmm? To change the framework of our body is very difficult. To change the framework of our mind is the easiest thing to do because that is the most flexible thing. But that you have made it like a concrete block. What do you want to use your head for? Just headbutting? <laughs> you must keep this as flexible as possible, isn't it? Hello? You have made this into a con concrete block, what is the intention? That's why I think so many are… S I mean, the, the such passionate football fans, the only <laughs> thing that you appreciate is this <laughs> That is also a good thing when it's done well, but <laughs> head can be used for many more things and uh, you can do many more things only if you keep it completely fluid and flexible. Otherwise, a concrete block is useful only for certain things. So it doesn't matter what labels they put on you. If you wish, you can change the structure of your mind. Pretty awesome. So I believe Sadhguru would like to start with some chanting. <laughs> I need to cross my legs and let my brains <laughs> Jananam 
सुकधम मरणम करुणम मिलनम मधुरम स्मरणम करुणम कालवश सकलम करुणम समय दिपत अखिल करुणम नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग That was amazing. Oh man. Thank you. Without the only it. way out is in. Yes, truly I believe that. I <laughs> why you got a big voice and my microphone is not working. Oh, he just had the great voice this guy. The great voice. <laughs> great voice. <laughs> um, May we begin? How is it? Is your mic okay? As long as it's not about, I'm okay. okay. There it is. <laughs> there it is. So tell me, um, what do you think you're here for? What would you think I would want to talk to you about? I'm sure you did research on me, my life and who I am and all that stuff. But what would you think I want to talk to you about? What would you think I would want to listen to you for? The first guys in the world get beaten by life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you said that was easy, huh? <laughs> that was so easy, huh? Wow. All my life, I thought I was this tough guy. Even recently, I was talking about if they say something, I'll blow it. And I and I do all this stuff all my life because I'm afraid. And if you tell me what I'm afraid of, I can't even tell you what. Why am I afraid? I'm successful. I'm, you know, I had some hard times, but I came back. But why am I afraid? Mm -hmm. We need to understand this. Uh, this has been hugely misinterpreted and misunderstood on various dimensions. Whether it's fear or love or anger or joy, we need to understand it's not about something, it's by itself. It is not that there must be something that you must be afraid of. It is not that there must be somebody that you are in love with. It is not that you are happy about something or miserable about something. You can be simply miserable. Hello? Tix? <laughs> or uh, you can be simply happy. You can simply sit here just by yourself and be very loving. You can sit here and be terrified about nothing. Because human experience is not created from outside. Human experience is happening from within. So what happens from within may sometimes find outside stimulus, but you can work it even without external stimulus. Hello? All of you are experts, aren't you? <laughs> without any external stimulus, you can create pain, you can create joy, you can create misery, you can create anger, love, fear, whatever you want. Because the seat of experience is within you. Only thing is you are not sitting there, you are crawling around it. You are supposed to be sitting there on the seat. If you are sitting on the seat of your experience, you would decide what should be the nature of your experience. Right now, because you're crawling around, 
something happens accidentally, we find an excuse, it's because of this guy I am suffering. Even if he's not there, we would find somebody else. Hello? <laughs> if that guy is not there, we'll find somebody else. If that is not there, we'll find something else. So, this is not about something. This is about that you have not taken charge of the seat of your experience, that's all. You just need an excuse. And the world will, of course, the world is quite enthusiastic about providing you the excuses. <laughs> it will. <laughs> they will provide lots of excuses. <laughs> but believe me, if you were alone in the desert, you would still go through all these things without anybody around you, without any threat to your life. Yes or no? So, this is the fundamental flaw with life. Instead of fixing myself, I want to fix the whole world. Well, do what you want. You can't even fix one more person absolutely in your life. Hello? Hundred percent? Did you get anybody ever just the way you want, one hundred percent? Did you? Even, they're telling me even robotic machines have their own characteristics, they do their own thing. <laughs> even if you have a dog these days, they do their own thing. Yes, because you couldn't fix anybody, that's why you try to settle with a dog. But even that guy does his own thing. You can never fix anything outside of you hundred percent. If at all, if you're looking for that kind of success, hundred percent, you can only try with this guy. Try anybody else, you will fail. Yes or no? Hello? Try anybody, you will definitely fail. There's only one. This one, you could do him hundred percent the way you want. If you manage this one the way you want, where is the question of fear, suffering, misery, all this? This is not because of situations. This is because of the state we are in. Because no investment has been made for the being. First of all, we must decide, are we human beings or are we human creatures? The difference between a creature and a being is, a creature is a consequence of compulsive reactions to everything around us, that's a creature. A being means you know how to be. If you knew how to be, would you be blissed out or would you make yourself fearful or miserable or what? What's your choice? You must choose, I'm going to bless you just now. <laughs> Definitely, highest level of pleasantness, isn't it, for yourself? What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but what you want for yourself is very clear, highest level of pleasantness. Why such a simple thing is hap not happening? It is not happening because, uh, you know, we gave you a very complex machine. Peak of evolution on this planet is you. Hmm? If you are an earthworm, you won't have these problems. Just eating, sleeping, reproducing, dying, you are fine. You are doing great as a creature, but you became human. Now it's a very complex machine, but you don't even bother to read the user's manual. Simply somehow you want to do it. Such a complex machine, if you try to do it somehow, accidentally, oh, it will cause much pain. Unable to bear pain, most people have given up on joy and moving towards pleasure. You must understand this. The need for entertainment and pleasure in the world has increased simply because there's no joy. If really human beings were joyful, they would not need so much entertainment and pleasure in their life. Pleasure becomes a compulsion. 
when there is no joyfulness and if you don't cause pleasure with something or the other, pain is just waiting in the background, just there. So, fear is not about something. Fear is just your inability to manage your thoughts. They are running away ahead of you. Fear is always about something that's yet to happen, isn't it? Yes. So that means you are suffering something that does not exist. If you suffer something that does not exist, there are medically very bad terms for that. It's not about one human being, it's just literally ninety-nine percent of the human population is in this condition, different levels maybe. But ninety-nine percent of the human population is in this condition, they are suffering things which do not exist. What happened ten years ago, they still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. What happened ten years ago does not exist right now. What may happen day after tomorrow does not exist right now. But things that don't exist, they suffer. Simply because two major faculties, two major faculties that you have which sets you apart distinctly from other creatures is, you have a very vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination. These two faculties, which are the best things you have, this is what most human beings are suffering. They are suffering their memory and they are suffering their imagination. These are the greatest tools you have. So, what should have been the most fantastic well-being? When I say well-being, you know Charles Darwin, that guy, the English guy? Hello? He said, all of you were monkeys, not me. He <laughs> that all of you are monk were monkeys and you became human. So uh, essentially, on this planet, you are the peak of evolution. You agree with me or no? Yes. Hmm? So if you are the peak of evolution. That means uh, you have come with the highest level of faculties. Because there are so many possibilities of being human, because your life is not fixed like that of a creature. When I say not fixed like a creature, for every other creature nature has drawn two lines within which they live and die. The reason why an animal's life looks so much simpler and better is because there are no possibilities. So what human beings are suffering is their possibilities. If you destroy the possibilities, you will also be fine. If you want, we can have a portion of your brain removed. You will be so peaceful, you will not know fear, you will not know suffering, you will not know anxiety, you will not know nothing. All we have to do is take away the possibilities. With the possibilities, the problems are also gone. So right now the problem is the fantastic possibilities that have been invested in us. So to take away the possibilities, either we can remove your brain or we can soak, soak it in whiskey. Both ways you can do it. You take away the faculties, then you're okay. So, the problem is just this, that when you are given something so complex, you need to spend a certain amount of time knowing the nature of the machine that you are using. See, some people are ha ha handling these cameras. That's not a spacecraft. It is simple enough machine. But I am sure these guys have spent years trying to know it the best. Just any of you get there and do it, what will happen out of it? Just see a simple machine like a camera. Yes or no? Somebody invested their life. The better they know it, the better they use it. Is it so? Hello? Yes. Why is that not true with this? The better you know this, the better you use it, isn't it? So if you know it really well, people say you realized. 
But those, I, I think most of us, um, especially when we come to the level which we're acknowledging of you, that we all have the urge to improve ourselves. No, they should not improve themselves. Why? Because they may, fear also may improve, misery also may improve. It's happening to a lot of people. See, why did we invent this idea of education? Twenty, twenty-five years of investment of life, nearly one-third of human… effective human life is invested in school and college for most people. So tell me, are educated people more joyful and fantastic compared to uneducated people? No, but that's not the only way to improve yourself. I don't only look at that in improving yourself, that's just… No, I'm saying that was the idea behind it, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, it's talking about it from far from a human perspective to reach your highest potential until you manifest that you don't even exist anymore. No, I'm saying improvement as an idea is not a good idea. What you need is realization that you realize what is the nature of your existence. From that, you do whatever. If it's a physical activity, you can improve. You can improve how you're doing something in the world, but you cannot improve this one. It's a fake thing. If you realize everything is settled, otherwise anyway it's a struggle. When situations are good, you pretend that you are improved. When situations turn against you, you will see who is who. When everything is going well, everybody is fantastic, you know. When life turns against you, still are you fantastic? That's a question. <laughs> I don't know. I think most people take life as it comes. From my experience, you know, I never thought um, any good would have ever happened to me. It's from being brought up in my environment, in my neighborhood, that you always saw bad things. People died. It was, either you, it was just normal seeing people die, seeing prostitutes, just seeing that kind of filth and stuff. It was normal. Matter of fact, it was even honorable because it became so um, normal. We normalized it. So it's like this. In the yogic culture, we always use lotus flower as a symbolism for human growth and development. Mm -hmm. Lotus flower grows best wherever filth is really thick. So, uh, why we are using lotus as a example or a symbolism is, this grows well because there is filth. It stays in the filth but untouched and fragrant. So this is a choice that all of us have. Either we can develop allergy to filth and run away and live in a mountain cave, there also filth will follow you in your head, it won't leave you. Or we can become part of the filth or we can blossom into your fragrant flower. This is a choice every human being has every moment of their life. Will they exercise this choice? That is a question mark. Yeah, I'm very flowerful. May? Definitely, man. You definitely are. Sadhguru, how does one begin to read the user manual? So, uh, user's manual means uh, that is a systematic way of observing simple things. When I say simple things, it is a fact that what you call as myself right now is largely the physical body. This is an accumulated dimension of who you are. You gathered it over a period of time, isn't it? Hmm? It's a food that you've eaten. It's just slowly gathered. So this is called as Annamaya Kosha. That means this is a food body. So what kind of food you're putting into your system has a consequence. Well, everybody may have grow up like that, but the question is, is it fulfilling the purpose of being a being, human being, not a human creature? Is it supporting your 
nature of being a human being? That's a question. Well, when it was a question of survival, we ate whatever came our way. That's a different matter. But now survival is taken care of, it's a time that we need to pay attention. If we want to be human being, what kind of body should I possess? Will it support my being or will it make me into a reactive process? All creatures, nothing wrong with them. You take a tiger or an elephant or a snake, nothing wrong with them, they are perfect creatures. Only thing is limited possibilities, isn't it? Hello? What else is wrong with them? Nothing is wrong with them, they're just fine. It's just that limited possibility. You got promoted to be a human being, this simply means enormous possibilities. If possibilities are not harnessed as an explode, you have enormous problems. What you are experiencing as problems are actually possibilities nudging you to explore. When you don't, they will freak you and they should because otherwise you may slip back in the evolutionary scale. It can happen to any human being. So, uh, one thing is the physical body. Of course, you have a thought process, you have an emotional structure or let's say the psychological scape. Mind is not in just in one place. Every cell in the body has its own intelligence and memory. Actually, in every cell in your body, there is more memory and more intelligence than your entire brain put together. Even million years ago, how your forefathers were, even their skin tone, your body still remembers, isn't it? So, the amount of memory that is there in every cell in your body is far bigger than what you hold in your mind. Even if it comes to the complexity of what every cell, the activity that it's performing, your brain is nowhere capable of managing that. So, we don't see intelligence or mind as one place, the entire body. So, this is a body of intelligence. Because people have gotten trapped in their own thought process, they think intelligence is only here. This entire system is full of intelligence, isn't it? Do you know how to manage your kidneys? I'm asking you, you know. Drink really? a lot of water, <laughs> no liquor. <laughs> that doesn't solve everything. Oh man. Many water drinkers have died too soon <laughs> I'm asking, the complexity of any one organ, are you able to manage consciously? No. It is why so do we believe we can though? Huh? Why do we believe we can? Uh, because we are full of bullshit. <laughs> yeah. We're pretty delusional, pretty much. Yes. Everything that we do not know, we want to believe. We are still not straight enough to come to this place. What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. Whatever I do not know, I believe. Well, you can bully yourself like this for some time. Because, uh, can I tell you a joke? Yeah, please. It's getting too tense here. <laughs> <laughs> so this happened. Uh, a bull and a pheasant were grazing upon the field. The bull was chomping on the grass and the, the pheasant was picking ticks off the bull, partnership. There was a huge tree at the edge of the field and uh, the pheasant looked up at the tree very nostalgically and said, Oh, alas, there was a time I could fly to the topmost branch of the tree. Now I do not have enough strength in my wing even to get to the first branch. The bull very nonchalantly said, That's no issue. Just eat a little bit of my dung every day. You will get to the topmost branch of the tree within a fortnight. The pheasant said, oh, come on, what kind of rubbish is that? The bull said, really, try it and see, the whole humanity is on it. <laughs> so the pheasant started pecking at the dung. 
And lo, on the first day itself, he reached the first branch of the tree. Within a fortnight, he, he did hit the topmost branch of the tree. He went and sat there on the topmost branch of the tree, just beginning to enjoy the scenery. The old farmer who was rocking on the rocking chair saw a fat old pheasant sitting on top of the tree. He pulled out his oh shotgun no. and shot the bird <laughs> of the tree. The moral of the story is, Many times, even bullshit can get you to the top, but it never lets you stay there. <laughs> so, people are trying to bull themselves into well-being. Somehow, tell yourself funny, fanciful things and feel good for some time, but full of fear. So full of fear, the entire humanity is full of fear because they're flying on bullshit. Unfortunately, they create all kinds of authorities which will dish out this bullshit. A time is coming, a very good time is coming, where uh, human intellect has fired in such a way that anything that is not logically correct, most people cannot digest anymore. Slowly we're getting there. So a time is coming, when truth will be the only authority. Authority can never be the truth in future. So good times are coming. It's just that we must hurry it up so that it happens in our times. Hey, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but when I come to United States, every time I stand near the immigration lines, they make me stand in a line which says resident alien. Oh man. Now you told me you're from that, that town in India, where that far, far from um, Taj Mahal you were telling me earlier? About? The where you're from? Or, or the town? In India, yeah. Oh, Mysore. Mysuru, it's called today. <laughs> yeah. How did, you, um, how did you get on your path? I thought I'm on a chair. No, no. <laughs> How did you get on a path to meeting people like this, like us? How did we get engaged? How, how did you start doing this? What made you believe you can do this? Again, you're talking about belief. Let yeah. me clear that first. <laughs> See, belief means just this. I believe in this or that means. I don't know, but I'm bullying you. Why can't I say I don't know? What's the problem? I do not know is a tremendous possibility in human life. If you see I do not know, naturally the longing to know will come, seeking will come, the possibility of knowing will come. Whatever I do not know, I believe, that means you will never know, you will just go on with your own stuff. So this is why believers always need a flock. But the moment you become a seeker, you become alone. Because if you are the only person who believes something on this planet that nobody else believes, you will feel like a bloody fool. You need twenty-five people around you who believe the same thing. Now you say, eh. <laughs> All kinds of rubbish. <laughs> but <laughs> when once twenty-five people gather around you and all of you believe the same thing, boo! Confidence without clarity will come. <laughs> Confidence without clarity is a great disaster that has unfolded upon humanity. It's mainly because of belief systems, mainly because people have become unwilling to see what I do not know, I do not know, what is the problem? So, uh, in the yogic culture, we evolved a method. We always identify with our ignorance, never with our knowledge. Because in this cosmos, nobody knows where it begins, where it ends. It's a… in our perception at least, it's a limitless space. In this space, even if you grind all the libraries on the planet and pour it into your head, still what you know is just a speck in the universe. If you identify with that speck, you will become that speck. 
because whatever you identify, you become that, isn't it? But our ignorance is boundless. If you identify with your ignorance, you will become boundless. So, what I am doing is not because of my confidence, because of clarity. I don't have any clarity. <laughs> I just know what I want and I see it and I consume it. But I don't look at it from a clarity perspective. I don't look at it from a educational perspective. I just know it has, I have to have that in order to establish my life the way I would want it to be. I just don't have no understanding of it. I just know it has to be possessed by me in order to function the way I would like to function. See, uh, clarity is on de various different levels. While well, you've been in a sport where if you did not see things clearly, you were down, licking your own sweat and blood. There was clarity, otherwise it wouldn't work. The clarity of why I'm existing, not the clarity of why I'm fighting, fighting as a child. No, no, I, I'm oh. just saying, clarity is at different levels. Yeah, exactly. I'm saying any sport for that matter, without clarity you wouldn't be able to function. So, without clarity, there is no successful action in anything. Now, uh, if we are talking about clarity about life itself, have we paid attention to life first of all? First of all, where is life? These days, if somebody says, my life, you will have to see through many things. They may be talking about their dog. They may be talking about their husband and wife. They may be talking about their children, they may be talking about their career, they may be talking about their wealth, they may be talking about their car. We don't know whether they may be talking about their property, their home. We don't know what they're talking about when they say, my life. So let me make this very clear. You have a body, you have a thought process and emotion. But to have all this, fundamentally you're alive, isn't it? You are alive with many accessories. But right now the accessories have become larger than the life itself. Once the accessories become more important or significant than life, then of course everything is topsy-turvy. If you have to walk on your head, it's difficult of course, because that's not the way life is designed. If you were designed to walk on your head, it would be okay. But you're not designed to walk on your head, you're trying to walk on your head, it's hard. If something happens, people suffer. If nothing happens, they will suffer. If they're poor, they suffer their poverty. You make them rich, they'll suffer the taxes. They're not educated, they suffer that. Put them to school, endless suffering. Not married, they will suffer that. Get them married, <laughs> I did not say anything. <laughs> Just tell me one aspect of life that human beings are not suffering. They are suffering every aspect. So offer them death, that will also they will suffer. So suffering is not because of the nature of life. Suffering is because of the complexity of the mind which you did not care to understand. If you had the brain of an earthworm, you would be fine. Hello? Peaceful, eco-friendly also, because that's a great aspiration in California. <laughs> the only life which is struggling to be eco-friendly is brilliant. <laughs> earthworm knows, a grasshopper knows, a lizard and a snake knows how to be eco-friendly. This most evolved creature on the planet is struggling to be eco-friendly, yes or no? <laughs> so, uh, the problem is complexity of possibilities. Possibilities are the greatest blessing we have, but unfortunately that's what we are suffering because when something very possible and powerful is given to you, if you don't handle it right, it'll blow up in your face. 
That's all that's happening. How do you know how to handle it? That's why I'm here. All right. <laughs> it's, it's not that… Uh, it's not that if… <laughs> let me put it this way, if… Uh, because of the number of things that I do across the world, more things are going wrong with my life right now than any of your lives, okay? <laughs> really, <laughs> too many things. Just I want you to imagine running a foundation where there are over nine to eleven million volunteers doing all kinds of things. Volunteers means nobody knows what to do, but they're enthusiastic. <laughs> running major projects like this, running massive centers in various places, over 350 centers across the world. Uh, if you want to go mad, this is the recipe for life. <laughs> but you think I will die of stress or madness? No, I'll not. Maybe I'll die of exhaustion, I don't mind. But of stress, no. I… there are many, many things, not everything in your life goes the way you think it should go. Huh? I should not be saying this but because as I'm… I'm like this, because it came in my mind, I'm telling you, please treat this with some sanctity. Right now, probably in the next few hours, my father will pass, okay? I've been monitoring this minute to minute, but uh, he will pass. I spent some time just before leaving with him and I came. I sent my girl back to be with him. So, uh, I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm fine, am not I? But does it mean to say I don't care about him? Hello? That's not how it is. A very intimate relationship. But uh, this is how I am. This does not mean there is no love in your heart, this does not mean that you are not involved. It is just that you are involved with everything, but you are never entangled. That's the difference. I believe that's our process of life or death or whatever we call it, just the process of what we do, isn't it? <clears throat> The most compulsive thing in most human beings is they want to draw a conclusion about everything. Because without drawing conclusion, they will not feel confident about anything in their life. They must draw a conclusion, oh, she's good, oh, she's okay, she's not okay, he's all right, that's so not good, I love this person, I hate this person, this is my friend, this is my enemy, every kind of conclusion. Conclusion means, essentially, what is the conclusion of your life? Death, isn't it? Every time you conclude, in some way you die, you must know this. You know, I can take you back. Are there religious people? Hello? Are you? Religious people? Because people are fundamentally misunderstanding their memory to be intelligence. This is the fundamental problem. Our education systems are designed like this, religious processes are designed like this, largely society is designed like this. Memory is misunderstood as intelligence. If you went to school, I didn't go much, nor did you, both of us are lucky that way. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. You're right. <laughs> but uh, when you went, when I went to school, what I saw was people memorize everything and on a specific day which is called examination day, they'll go and puke it there. If they puke really well, they are great 
ये ग्रेट स्कूल आई प्यूक लिटिल आई नेवर प्यूक एट ऑल आई नेवर प्यूक एट ऑल यू नेवर प्यूक नेवर नॉट इवन वन मिनट आई प्यूक लिटिल बट दोस हु प्यूक एवरीथिंग वर नंबर वन आउट देयर so this is not just in a classroom everywhere this is built we are misunderstanding memory as intelligence as i said earlier great times are coming when your memory will mean nothing because there is a simple phone in my machine which has more memory than all of you put together hello so your memory will mean nothing But because if you lose that phone, your memory huh? will be in trouble too. No, no, we can have it implanted in the skin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what we thought as great value, I want you to understand how this world has been built. These civilizations and cultures have been built. There was a time when nobody could read. All right. So one guy comes and he opens one book. he's got only one book all the time well if you read 10 books you become a scholar if you remember 10 books people say you are a phd if you know one book you become a representative of god how is this forever it's been happening this will not work in the future because uh, my phone will recite all the scriptures put together at one time <laughs> Yes, it will. Yes or no? <laughs> Just because the guy knew how to read, he was acting like a representative of God. Suppose I came to California thousand years ago on a bicycle, when nobody had seen a bicycle. You don't know what it is. I came riding on these two thin wheels. Wow! I came and parked here. and said i have just come from heaven on this special <laughs> god given vehicle you would all bow down so after i finish my whatever bull with you when i want to go and rest i take away the front wheel and sleep on it because if any of you learn how to ride then my heavenly status will go but a local brat was good for nothing took this bicycle with single wheel and started riding it all over the place now i am in trouble this is happening huh? the google lady will recite every scripture that you want we don't know who the hell she is <laughs> but she can tell you anything you want she will tell you the meaning also interpretations also yes or no so just in many ways in many ways because human beings by themselves did not do it because people did not do it consciously i think in many ways the technological developments are going to end a whole level of <laughs> nonsensical things that have been happening just because somebody remembers something somebody can recite something they were elevated all this will go very good times but in the meantime when one level of what we believed collapses and before you attain to clarity there is a danger one thing that's happening is in the world heavens are collapsing 100 years ago how many people believed they are going to heaven and today how many people believe they're going to heaven has come down dramatically isn't it so so is it okay good yeah <laughs> <laughs> real good this happened this happened in alabama well um, a sunday school teacher was going full fire this alabama full fire unfortunately the audience were not like you they were all tiny tots catch them young policy 
In his rhetoric, he stopped and asked, what do you have to do to go to heaven? Little Mary in the front row, she's always in the front row, said, if I scrub the church floor every Sunday morning, I will go to heaven. Absolutely! <laughs> Another little girl stood up and said, if I share fifty percent of my pocket money with my less privileged friend, I will go to heaven. Correct! Another little boy stood up and said, if I help those who are in need, I will go to heaven. Correct! Little Tommy in the back bench stood up and said, you got to die first. <laughs> That's a qualification. Yeah. You got to die first. <laughs> so when we die, depending upon your culture, we will either bury you or burn you or cut you and throw you to the birds. Different cultures, depending upon which culture you are, that they will do. Or in other words, this body is a piece of planet that we gathered slowly. It's good you put it back. I heard that Americans these days are not putting it back anymore. They're building a concrete grave and an aluminum casket. Even when you're dead, you don't want to be eco-friendly. <laughs> what is this? At least when we die, we should put this goddamn body back into the soil. Absolutely. <laughs> That's where it came, that's where it should go. But the even that they are not doing. Huh? And let the bugs eat it. <laughs> Some people are planning to take it to Mars. <laughs> anyway, you left your body here and went to heaven. What is in heaven? You don't, you don't, you know what's in heaven? You? No, don't know. Are you should know these things. In the… in the Hindu heaven, food is very good. Good food. Indians, you know. Lives are invested in cooking and eating. In the other place, there are white gowned ladies floating around in the clouds. If you like that kind of ambience, you can go there. In another place, you will encounter virgin problems. If that's what you're looking for, that's fine too. Only problem is, you went to heaven without a body. What do you do with good food and virgins, I'm asking? <laughs> Hello? These are all problems you have when you have a body. Once you don't have a body, what do you do? Food, if you put it here, it'll fall down. Hello? <laughs> No, if you ask these questions, heavens will collapse. Heavens are collapsing. I think nearly seventy percent of the heavens in human mind has collapsed in the last fifty years. What do you think? Huh? And anyway, let me ask you this. Do you have any proof that you are not already in heaven and making a mess out of it? Do you have any proof? You're already in heaven, but making a mess out of it. Tell me, if you just change the geography of your existence, will everything about you change, I'm asking you? Hello? If you move from one place to another, you think everything will change? No. If this person, one person changes, everything changes. Doesn't matter where we are. If we raise human consciousness, that is, if we teach people, how to sit here and be just blissed out. Hello? Look at my eyes, I'm always stoned. I'm not on any of your products, but <laughs> No, you're not. I'm definitely not. But look at me, I'm always stoned. Because the greatest chemical factory on the planet is here. To what extent means, Per second, your body is processing something like thirteen, I mean thirty-seven, three-seven followed by twenty-one zeros, whatever that number is. To give you a perspective, eleven zeros make a trillion. 
37 followed by 21 zeros. That many chemical reactions are happening in this body per second. If you knew how to manage this, you can create any kind of experience you want in this. When you have this kind of a sophisticated machine, you are doing things in a caveman-like way. This is like we gave you a touch screen phone, but you are like this. Awesome. What will come out of that? <laughs> you are supposed to do like this, but you are like this. You know what will come out of it? That's all that's happening right now. So there is a way. Today I can proudly say across the world there are millions of people if they close their eyes in the morning, tears of ecstasy and love every day in their life, every day, millions of people. So it is not an accident that one person, obviously it can be done. Just a little understanding of how human chemistry functions. You don't have to go into chemical analysis of who you are, there are simple processes with which one can do if one is willing to invest a little bit of time in a day. Life will become wonderful because by curtailing human faculty, you cannot believe you're enhancing life. Right now, most human beings believe they enhance their life by curtailing human faculties. Like, uh, you know, I was… Uh, I was in Mysore city. I had to meet somebody, so I went into a building. A lady over seventy, seventy-five years of age and, and uh, she's a very petite, small woman. She just comes up to me with a big smile on her face. How are you doing? I, I don't forget faces, I may forget names, but I don't forget faces that I see. I just look at her, I don't know her. But okay, I respond, I'm doing wonderful, how are you doing? Da, da, da. Then I go up. After twenty minutes, I get off the elevator and I'm just coming. She again comes up to me and with the same full enthusiasm, How are you doing? So, wow, this is just twenty minutes ago. <laughs> then I respond somehow and then I'm getting into the car. Somebody who was walking with me says, Poor lady, she's lost her memory. She doesn't remember a thing. I said, She seems to be doing wonderful. <laughs> I don't think she was this happy with her memory on. <laughs> right now she is exuberant because she's forgotten everything. <laughs> this is the case with most human beings. Little drink and they forget something. Now they're exuberant. Lowering your faculties and being… thinking that I'm well is a serious mistake. This happened. One day Shankaran Pillai, so, uh, he was uh, just outside in the marketplace and he met an old friend, a college friend that he had not seen for more than twenty-five, thirty years. So, they really jammed up and he invited him home and he came home for dinner. When they were sitting for dinner, Shankaran Pillai, every time he wants to ask something of his wife, he says, my sweetie pie, my honey, my boo-boo-boo, my bulbul, my choo-choo-choo, like this. After the dinner is over and the chat is over, the friend is leaving, the Shankaran Pillai came to the door to see him off. He said, you're really having an amazing life. Me and my wife can't even talk to each other properly. Every time you refer to her, all this sweetie, honey, choo-choo-choo, boo-boo-boo, all this stuff, you're really having an amazing life, aren't you? Sankaran Pillai said, are you crazy, man? Seven years ago I forgot her name <laughs> Oh no <laughs> So many people are well only when they lose their faculties because their problem is of evolution. Their problem is just that they got upgraded and they don't know how to handle it. So tell us, how many children do you have? Hmm? How many children do you have? I know you spoke of a daughter. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to know about you. How many children do you have? <laughs> All right, I won't ask. Them. <laughs> no, 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 you can ask. I have millions of them, only one is my mistake. Oh, no, man. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. <laughs> I have many, 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 but only one is my mistake. Okay. Hey, this is really an awesome meeting. I can't even believe you're here. I'm just still in a daze. I'm just really happy to have you here with me <laughs> and my friend, Eben. This is really almost like a dream come true. We saw you and we were just um, in the stage of just, and you know, just reasoning with enlightenment and we saw your, um, your story, how you became, you, one day you came and you fainted and you thought you were there for an hour and you were there for like 14 hours. That's my story that's so, what didn't that happen to you? <laughs> yeah, so I thought that I thought that was amazing, and so I stayed. I'm um, a great fan, and I stayed following you. And then I was um, talking to Evan, and I would say, Evan, you think we could ever get him down here? You think he'd come down here and talk to us? We never believed you would do it, and now you're here. That's just man, so mind-boggling. <laughs> Thank you, really. So now uh, that you asked this question, uh, how to do the real user's manual. You know, about on 27th of October was the Diwali festival. It's a festival of lights in India. Because people, these millions of people have been supporting me, particularly for the river movements that I've been doing uh, in India. 162 million people supported the movement. It's the largest movement anywhere in the world at any time. So, uh, with money, with uh, volunteering, in many ways they've been supporting us. So, I thought on the festival day, let me offer them a gift. And I said, uh, on the Diwali day, if you register in engineering online, which normally costs $150 per person, I said, it's free on this day for you. Whoa! 740,000 people registered. It's cost me a few million dollars now. <laughs> now, how do you feel about that? How does that make you feel? Uh, it's fantastic that so many people were waiting to do it. So now, uh, I'm still in the same mode. So for all of you who are here today, we'll offer in engineering online free if you register before, before midnight today. <laughs> That's the user's manual. <laughs> I want you to understand, life is a certain exuberance of energy and a certain amount of time. This is all we have, a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy. Do you have anything more? Rest is all imagined, isn't it? So this time is simply rolling away for everybody. We may think of many things, but actually time is just rolling away as you sit here. Since you came and sat here, you are two hours closer to your grave, yes or no? Yes. Hello? Yes. All of us. So you can't hold it back, you can't roll it back, time is just going. So the only thing you can manage is your energies. If you keep it phenomenally exuberant, you will know life with a certain intensity. If you keep it low, you will know life in a minimal way. So now this choice is yours. Now let's say, Time is passing, as the day passes into night, you'll feel a little sleepy. Why? Your energies are like poof. Now you fell asleep. As far as your experience is concerned, you're as good as dead, isn't it? You don't exist, the world doesn't exist for those few hours. But you woke up in the morning, once again the energy has renewed itself and this is what you call as life. This renewal of energy and exuberance of energy is what you're referring to as life. So, if you want to experience life, if you want to know life, if you want to really ride this wave of life, your energy should be at the highest exuberance level or should it be put down? I'm asking you. Hi. Hi. So, uh, you mean a different thing by saying hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably the only one that doesn't 
to smoke marijuana or do any of <laughs> No, no, I'm not asking you <laughs> any of those things. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, this... You're a neat trick. <laughs> It is, uh, it is just that most people need all the time looking for rest, vacation, break from everything simply because they don't know how to manage their thought and emotion. I see in the United States people are saying, thank God it's Friday because they suffer five days and they're going to enjoy two days. Life is not going to work like this. Life cannot work like this. If you do not know how to be joyful, then you are only looking for pleasure. If you were joyful, pleasure wouldn't matter because you are just joyful. Joy is not a consequence of some activity or something that you get or don't get. Joy is an ambience that is necessary to live life. If you do not know how to be peaceful and joyful, well, you cannot even enjoy your dinner tonight, isn't it? Hello? Can't enjoy a walk on the street. Can't enjoy the few people who are around you. You cannot enjoy anything. You need all kinds of stimulus to find a little bit of pleasantness within yourself. When I say pleasantness, let's understand this. If this body becomes pleasant, we call this health. You want this or no? Yes. Hey, you must choose, I'm going to bless you. Yes. You want this body to be pleasant or no? Yes. yes, yes. If it becomes very pleasant, if it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If this man becomes pleasant, we call it peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If these emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If this life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. If it becomes pleasant, we call this ecstasy. If our surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. Only to create pleasantness in our surroundings, we need the cooperation of various people and forces around us. But pleasantness of body, pleasantness of mind, pleasantness of emotion and energy is one hundred percent your business. Yes or no? Yes. I agree. So, uh, if you want to make this your business, before midnight you must register for In Engineering Online. It's free, otherwise tomorrow morning you can pay and register. <laughs> oh, man! <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, this has been such a treat. And before we wrap this thing up, we have time for a few questions. All right. Are you not you? I'm them. No, I'm just yeah. checking you. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much. Sadhguru talked about the Anamaya Kosha, which is the body kosha. There are five koshas in the applied yogic sciences which uh, work the entire system of the body from the mind to the heart to the breath to the energy. Um, I need all that. And the heart. There are thousands of years of manuals from classical yoga, which is just meditation, to hatha yoga, to the tantrika, that um, provide ways of being that um, Sadhguru is uh, has expressed the top of tonight. So it's not an abstraction at all. It's just like what you guys do on hotboxing, which is break down how you get to the soul of yourself by moving through your ego, yeah. by practicing goodness towards others. So. Oh. That's real tough, too. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult process. Uh, the, for me, it was. For me. No, the thing is this. Well, uh, just to explain this, a Sadhguru means an uneducated guru. He is not a PhD in all these things. He is uh, unread. I don't know any books. 
I just know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate nature. If you want to know life, the only life that you can know is this life. You cannot lo know another life because you can only experience this one. Can you experience something else? You can only experience this life if at all if you experience. So, uh, if we want to… if you want scholarship, there are many things. But if you want realization, in is the only way out, he's already been espousing that. If you want scholarship, if you want PhD in spiritual process, that's a different matter, it's an academic stuff. But if you want realization, in is the only way out. Why do you think there are books about life? You should read a book about life only if you are not alive. Suppose you are not alive, then to know about life you must read a book. When you are the life, hello? The only thing that you need to do is turn inward. Inward means what? Right now the only way you are perceiving anything is through the five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. This is the way you know the world. None of these things are geared to turn inward. You can't roll your eyeballs inward and scan yourself. You can hear this, but you can't hear so much activity that's happening here. If an ant crawls upon your hand, you can feel it. So much blood flowing, you cannot feel it because the sense organs are essentially outward bound. So, uh, to turn inward, you need a different faculty. To activate that, to engage in that is the most important thing because life is very brief. Only miserable people have a long life. <laughs> <laughs> if you're joyful and exuberant, it's a very brief life. Yes, it's very, very brief. Have you noticed on a particular day, you're very happy, twenty-four hours, poof, went up like a moment. You're a little depressed. Twenty-four hours feel like ten thousand years. Hello? Because only miserable people can have a long life. Otherwise, it's a very brief life. In this brief life, the most important thing is you know the nature of your existence. Don't add all kinds of uh, philosophies to this, this is very simple. It's like you bought a phone, a new phone. Should you read the user's manual in the first three days or should you read it after three years when you're discarding it? This is all. The first three days if you read it, you'll use the phone effectively, isn't it? To use this effectively, quickly, as quickly as possible, we must get this. Then we live life without you being an impediment in your own life. Other impediments are always there. Hmm? Other things are always there, we need to learn to ride it. If you don't learn to ride it, it'll crush you of course. You see California people are riding the waves. Hmm? What is the dream of a wave rider? One day he would like to do the tsunami. <laughs> yes or no? One who is really good at it, what is he dreaming of? One day when the tsunami comes, he would like to be riding on the wave. Those who do not know how to ride the wave, they are terrified of it. This is all it is. The instruments of life, must be in your hands. If they are in your hands, whatever life throws at you is not your choice. What you make out of it is your choice. This will not come out of scholarship. This will come by turning inward. This is why inner engineering, you engineer yourself the way you want yourself to be. I agree. This is Jim Gray right here, sir, by the way. <laughs> uh, if you uh, will make uh, the word bother a little more clear, you mean to say why? Oh, nothing does. Because I have not given the privilege to anything or anybody that they can decide what happens within me.
effectively doesn't bother you because you just don't, you don't what? What is the mechanism? See, it's just this. As I said just now, what life throws at you is not your choice. It throws all kinds of things. The more active you are, uh, more number of things are being thrown at you. But what you make out of it within yourself is hundred percent yours, isn't it? Now, if you are a compulsive reaction to what life throws at you, then everything will bother you. Good things and bad things, everything will bother you. But if you are a conscious response, to whatever is thrown at you, you will see everything is a certain challenge. Some we can handle, some we don't know how to handle. Hmm? Some situations we know how to handle, some situations we don't know how to handle. So, are you a superman that you know how to handle everything? No. This is not about being superhuman. This is about realizing being human is super. So it's not that you know everything and you can handle everything, no. Some you can handle, some you cannot handle. But are you a conscious response to life or are you a compulsive reaction to life? This is all you can take care of. Anybody else? This is a cool. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I if, um, with the good, with the good work, the work that you're doing, uh, Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the result, the desire of what you're trying to do. How do you detach, but at the same time help? I'm using these simple terms. You have re been reading Indian stuff. Huh? <laughs> You've been reading Indian stuff. That's why this detachment and all that. Tell me, can you experience anything in this world without involvement? If you're not involved, how will you know anything? You cannot experience anything unless there is involvement. The more profound your involvement is, the more profound your experience of life is, isn't it? So where did this detachment come? This is because you got entangled and it hurts. Now somebody told you remain detached. See, if you want to really detach from life, you must be dead. That's efficiency. Hello. <laughs> you know, I was doing a program <laughs> and this lady stands up to introduce herself and she says her name and says, I've come from Singapore. In the last two years, I committed suicide five times. I said, stop. <laughs> I said, at this level of inefficiency, you are not getting anywhere in your life. <laughs> five times you committed suicide and you're standing here. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I like efficiency, hello? You, whatever the, the hell you want to do, at least you must do it well. <laughs> so, uh, because you got entangled and it hurt you, now you're thinking detachment. No, without involvement you will not know a damn thing in this life. If you want to detach, the best thing is death, you're detached. Why are you here and trying to be detached? It is just that, as I said earlier, your problem is you're trying to experience something which is not yet. That is, you're having a mental diarrhea. <laughs> you're suffering a mental diarrhea and you think you're engaged with future. You are never engaged with future, I want you to understand. You are never engaged with past or future. You are just having a mental diarrhea, isn't it? Hello? Right now, can you live what happened yesterday? No, no, in your mind you can have mental diarrhea and think it is actually happening again. Or can you live what may happen tomorrow? But you can have mental diarrhea and believe that actually you're experiencing it. Because you don't have a distinction between what is psychological reality and what is existential. This is the problem. You are mistaking your psychological drama to be life. Your psychological drama is not life. 
Right now, unfortunately, a whole lot of human beings have gone into this. They misunderstand their thought and emotion as life. No, it's just your thought and emotion. They're supposed to play the way you want. But you are playing the way they want. Hmm? Just little out of control, that's all. Don't weave a philosophy out of an ailment. I would think when you were saying, um, oh, like on myself, like we almost, let's just go to another perspective. Uh, myself, what, what, what's the image of myself? What, what should be my illusion of myself? No, what should be my illusion of myself just as a human being functioning in the world with life? What should be my illusion of myself? Should I be a nothing or should I be glamorous, magnanimous, powerful? What should I be? See, uh, what social qualities we need to exist here well, let us not misunderstand that as life. This is just little sense. We are among people, we must be in a certain way, so that it works for you and me. If I do something that works only for me, not for you, you will make sure my life is miserable somehow. Yes or no? Hello? I can trust you on that, come on. <laughs> If every day we are transacting about something and I make my transactions in such a way it's only beneficial for me, not for you, will you make my life miserable or no? Yes. You will. This is the nature of coexistence. So when we are here together, it's important we function in such a way that whatever we do, it benefits both of us so that this transaction can go on. Whether it's marketplace or marriage, both the parties should benefit, otherwise it'll die, isn't it? So this, do not misunderstand this understanding or this simple sense as human nature. No, this is just simple sense. If you were living in the jungle alone, you would live one way. You live with certain number of people, you will live another way. You live with a large number of people, you live completely different way. This is just simple sense of adapting to the existence we are. So, do not understand this as the nature of your life, no. This is just sense. Some people figure it out early, some people figure it out later, but this is just sense. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sadhguru. Um, we're out of time. Out of time? Out of time. Uh, but I want to thank you guys again so much for coming. Thank you, Sadhguru, and your incredible team. Uh, I would like to say it's wonderful to be here. I watched Mike fight way back. And uh, this may sound a little off, but... At that time, uh, there were no televisions in India. We used to get 8 mm films to play on the wall, project on the wall. So uh, this would go cut, 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 like that, you know. He was fighting like this, 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 this. this. <laughs> So in somebody's house, we were sitting and watching, we had watched lots of boxing matches at that time because I was a… Uh, this I shouldn't tell you. <laughs> I was in my school boxing team. Really? <laughs> wow. You struck someone before? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so… Uh, so on that day, when I watched probably the first, first time when you won the heavyweight, when we saw that and uh, much debate was going on, I said, uh, well, this guy could rule the boxing ring if he only maintains his balance. Because I saw a talent which I'm… I was just watching your interview today, which I think you're… Uh, that wonderful man who took you up and transformed 
a street brat into your champion. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> he did. He did. He did. So he, he saw the brother. talent too, I'm sure, and that's why he invested himself. It's fantastic. It's just this. Every human being, many things are hidden within every human being. Not everybody, unfortunately, gets the situational opportunities to shine. It's happened wonderfully in your life. Well, other things have happened. Though you came up with at most disadvantage, you turned that into a phenomenal advantage in some way. But I hope the next part of your life will be more enlightening and more contributing to everybody's life because whatever talents we have, whatever intelligence we have, whatever capabilities we have, they will find maximum benefit to ourselves and to everybody. Above all, balance. If that one thing is there, everything else will find expression. If we lose that one thing, our talents and our capabilities unfortunately will turn against us. Right now, human beings are only suffering their own intelligence. If they had no brains, they would be fine. They are suffering their own intelligence simply because there is no balance. It is time that all of us in some way bring balance to ourselves and to the world around us so that human genius really flows without too much struggle. Right now, to find expression to human genius, people are going through enormous struggle and slowly people are believing that unless you struggle it won't come out. No, it can be done very joyfully, wonderfully, blissfully if only balance is created. So let's invest in this, that this generation and the coming generations are far more balanced within themselves. If this one thing happens, you will see an incredible generation coming up. Let's all be a part of making that happen, considering being born in an extreme disadvantage and how you turned it into what you did at the age of twenty, being a world champion happened in spite of all the disadvantages. So, uh, all of us together should invest in making this happen for many, many more of the next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of them looked at the other up and down and said, You seem okay. How am I? <laughs> This is just like that, isn't it? You're sitting here, you're alive, you're existing and you're asking me, who am I, what am I? <laughs> is it not ridiculous? Very ridiculous, isn't it? Only thing is, the majority is with you. That's the only comfort which has not allowed you to know the pain of ignorance. You have a huge majority of people around you who are all saying, yes, this is the way to be. Yes, that is the only thing which has given you some comfort. Suppose you are the only man on the planet who does not know who you are, everybody else knows. You know how it would be for you? Yes, you don't know who you are, you are busy in the world. Does it make any sense or does it sound like madness? Hmm? Insanity, isn't it? But the comfort is you are in a huge asylum where everybody is like you. So your problem is, your existence itself right now is only in comparison with something else. You have no existence of yourself, please see. Right now, <clears throat> if you don't have something that everybody has, everybody has nose. Suppose you did not have a nose, actually you can breathe better, you know. If you take off your nose, you will get twenty-two percent extra oxygen you will be more healthy, everything will be better. But you know how you will suffer? Because everybody else has a nose. Yes or no? Or if you get something extra that other people don't have, you still suffer, isn't it? Suppose you grew one horn. <laughs> you know how terrible it would be? But if everybody had a horn, then we would be polishing it and decorating it and you know, Your very existence is in comparison 
there is no existence of yourself. Everything is in comparison. So, with that comfort you're passing off without knowing the pain of not knowing. If you know the pain of not knowing who you are, then if you just see that I don't know anything about myself, tears will come. If it starts tearing you apart, knowing is not far away. It's very simple. It's very, very simple because after all you want to know what is within you, isn't it? Can what, in, what is within you be denied to you by anybody or anything? Hmm? Do you need a passport to go within? Do you need a visa? To turn inward and know what's within, do you need somebody's permission? Or can somebody stop you? Can any authority in the world stop you? No. So who is stopping you? Who could be stopping you? Only yourself. Nobody else but yourself. Nobody else is capable of stopping you, isn't it? So why are you stopping yourself? Simply because you made your whole existence outside of yourself. Your very existence is only in comparison with somebody. Because this has happened to you simply because the very nature of sense organs is like this. Because your experience of life is limited to sense perception, that is the reason why you are existing in comparison with somebody, not by yourself. Because sense organs are like this. If I touch this, this feels cool to me. This feels cool to me not because of the way the steel rod is, simply because of the way my body temperature is. If I lower my body temperature and touch this, this would be warm to me. Yes? Is that so? If I lower my body temperature to minus hundred and touch this, this would be red hot to me. Is it so? So your very basic experience of life because it is limited to sense perception, everything is in comparison. So your very existence has become in comparison. If this has to change, philosophies and teachings are not going to change this fundamental reality. If your experience of life transcends the limitations of sense perception, suddenly everything is different. When we initiated you into Shambhavi, if you gave yourself to the process, it could easily take you beyond sense perception. Many of you going into moments where you are no more within your sense perception, something else is beginning to happen, anything new happens, your mind is such, it knows only fear. Even if you walk into heaven, you will know only fear because it's something that you do not know. You have conditioned yourself like this. But if you allow it to happen, you will see, you will start experiencing a dimension which is beyond sense perception. Only when your experience of life moves beyond sense perception, then your experience of life is absolute, not in comparison with something else. Then your experience of life has transcended the limitations of the physical. Then you have created an atmosphere to know who the hell you are. You better know who the hell you are. Otherwise, anything that you do is of no consequence. When will you learn how to handle my thought, how to handle my emotion, how to handle my body, how to handle my chemistry? When are you going to figure this? At the end of your life? Because this culture has grown, when to do spirituality means when you're seventy, when you're no good for anything else. No, at the earliest possible time, whatever is most profound about you, not about heavens, about this life, everything that you need to know, you must know soonest, isn't it? My whole thing is, I'm constantly reminding people, there is only one enemy in your life, that's you. If you fix this one person, everything is fine with you. Yes or no? You have only one enemy, that's yourself. If you fix this one person, this is a wonderful life. So this is the beauty of your life, that this moment you can be whichever way you want to be. Now this freedom, 
is what humanity is struggling with right now. If you are suffering your bondage, it's all right, but you are actually suffering your freedom. If your life was as fixed as any other creature's life, you would not experience any stress, you would go through it effortlessly. Now your problem is, there is freedom to be whichever way you want to be the next moment. This is what you are struggling with. If you are suffering your bondage, it's all right. If you are suffering your freedom, that's a tragedy, isn't it? Your life is not a tragedy because this happened or that happened. Your life is a tragedy because everything is happening and you are missing it. Yes? This did not happen, that did not happen, that's not a tragedy. Sun came up in the morning but you cannot experience it. You are breathing, you cannot experience that. You are alive, you cannot enjoy that. This is a tragedy, isn't it? Yes or no? What happened, what did not happen is not the point. The most significant aspect of your life is that you are alive right now. Is that so? Everything else is secondary and incidental. Is that so? Yes? But you are not aware of your aliveness. You are busy with your psychological nonsense. Your thoughts, your emotions have become your psychological reality has become far more important than your existential reality. What it means is, you are so enamored with your own petty creation that you are completely missing the grandeur of creator's creation, that's what it means. You do all kinds of things, but if you truly value creation, the best thing that you can do is to pay attention and to experience it, isn't it? Yes or no? What is the greatest tribute? Suppose somebody cooked some nice food and presented it in front of you, what is the greatest tribute? That you write a poetry on it or you joyfully eat it, which is better? Somebody has done a work of art, you ignore it and give him an award. Is that great or you truly appreciate and enjoy it, is that great? If you truly value the creator and the creation, the best thing is that you lived blissfully. That is the best appreciation for the creator. One more year gone, are you still alive? And what are you alive to? What are you dead to? When was the last time you saw a full moon or a sunrise? When was the last time you gazed at a mountain or the ocean? Or you looked at a butterfly fly. When was the last time you saw a flower blossom or kicked a ball? When was the last time you smiled at yourself? When was the last time you looked back and could laugh at yourself? Come alive. Your role in the existence is so small. Everything that happens to you largely is being done to you. Are you spinning the planet? No. Could you live if it di did not spin? Could you live? No. Are right now it's me versus the universe. This is just your psychological condition. This is not the reality. Even when you feel utterly lonely, are you still breathing? So you're transacting with the world, isn't it? Yes? You only can't get along with the people around you, but atmosphere is okay with you, food is okay if it tastes good. Water is okay, you have transaction with the world, isn't it? Your existence is constantly an engagement with the universe, but your mind becomes against the universe. If you create a psychological condition that you're against or you're in competition with the universe or the cosmos, obviously you will feel crushed for small things. Little things will crush you. When I say little things, maybe you failed your examination, maybe you got thrown out of this university, maybe you got fired from a job, maybe somebody ditched you, maybe something else like this happened. These are all small things between life and death. Because you came here with nothing, isn't it? 
When you die, there is no container service for you. You die with nothing. In spite of that, most people have turned their homes into warehouses. Most people are carrying such a huge baggage on their head, as if they are carrying the whole universe on their head. This is their own psychological condition. Your thought and emotion is what you're talking about, right? When are you going to figure out how to handle your thought and emotion? Not hers, not hers, not his, yours. When are you going to learn how to handle my thought and my emotion at the end of your life? The only problem really with life is just this. Most human beings have taken themselves too seriously. They don't understand. You've seen on the computer screen these pop-ups? You are a pop-up on this planet. You pop up for two seconds and pop out. No, no, you must see, countless number of people like you and me have walked this planet. They were also big people. Where are they? All? Topsoil? Topsoil or no? Or maybe you're planning to go to heaven. Hello? Anybody who talks about a place other than this place, as a better place than this, this is a crime against humanity. My fundamental work is to destroy all heavens so that people will learn to live well here. All these idiots who made a hell out of themselves, they want to go to heaven. They made a mess out of this place and then they want to go to heaven. I am asking you, do you have any proof? Do you have any proof that you are not already in heaven and messing it up? Do you have any proof? You are already in heaven, making a mess out of it, yes? Simply because you are not even learning how to handle your basic faculties of thought and emotion, isn't it? Your only justification is, everybody is like this only. That's how it is in a madhouse. That is how it is in a madhouse, only a doctor looks crazy. <laughs> so when are you going to handle it? Slowly, at the age of sixty? I'm asking one thing that you do, one thing that everybody who considers themselves some kind of sadhaka or a seeker, one thing that you must do to yourself is, you are absolutely truthful to yourself. If you're also truthful to everybody around you, you will get other kinds of benefits with people. But I will not go that far right now. With yourself, you are one hundred percent truthful. Otherwise, all kinds of tricks keep happening. To be truthful to yourself is not a easy thing because there is lifetimes of habit of simply bullshitting yourself. And of course, <laughs> you've gone through much religious training, many of you <laughs> So you have a very sophisticated way of bullshitting yourself. <laughs> See, uh, this is an unfortunate condition that a whole lot of human beings are in, in their experience, in their personal experience, life is like me versus the universe. Being in competition with the universe is a stupid thing to do. That's not a competition you must get into. Hello? Me versus the universe is a bad competition to get into. So, this is why yoga… Yoga does not mean twisting and turning your body. The word yoga means union. <laughs>